Does manual treasury management and operations have your crypto business stuck in the slow lane? Scale up and speed ahead with Fireblocks, the number one platform for crypto operations and trading pros that makes custody, settlement, and rebalancing quick and easy. Visit fireblocks.com to learn more. This episode is brought to you by Coinbase Prime, an integrated solution that provides institutional investors with an advanced trading platform, secure custody, and prime services to manage all of their crypto assets in one place. Futuristic companies like Tesla and MicroStrategy have used Coinbase's comprehensive investing platform to execute some of the largest trades in the industry. Learn more by visiting coinbase.com prime to get started today. I'd also like to give a shout out to Cross River. Whether you're a crypto exchange, NFT marketplace, or wallet, Cross River's integrated API-based platform provides the payment solutions you need to grow. A CryptoFin industry award winner and an early partner for companies like Coinbase, Cross River's tech stack supports crypto partners and enables real-time money movement for consumers. Welcome to a new world of crypto-friendly banking at crossriver.com crypto. All opinions expressed by hosts and podcast guests are solely their own opinions and not necessarily those of the blocks. Podcast guests may have taken positions in the assets or other matters discussed in this podcast. This podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be relied upon as a basis for investment decisions. For full terms, visit theblockcrypto.com slash terms dash service. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to The Scoop. I'm your host, Frank Chaparro, Director of News at The Block, and we're in Crypto Bahamas. We're joined by a very special guest, Kristen Smith, Executive Director of The Blockchain Association. Why Why aren't you president or like CEO? CEO. Of we can talk about that later. <laughs> Kristen is one of the most prominent leaders in the policy, crypto policy world, and also, probably most importantly, is the current record holder for the most appearances on this show. It's my life's greatest achievement. It is, and it's only amplified the achievement by the fact that you've beat billionaire Sam Bankman Freed by one episode. Kristen, thanks so much for joining us. We've got a lot we've got a lot to talk about. I mean we had um, so many things. We had a lunch earlier today. Well you Gate crashed the lunch, which was which was great. You invited me to the lunch. Yes, but we were able to prepare for the show to an extent. One thing that we talked about was whether or not the Hill has sort of come to terms with the amount of political firepower in this space. And the question is, has it, and to what degree has it not? So I think they're waking up to it, and I think they're excited about it. And I think there's sort of three primary ways that elected officials on Capitol Hill are understanding the growing political power of the crypto community. Um, number one is just the fact that there are so many professionals on the ground in Washington that are working on this space, right? Like if you look even back to a year ago, it was a couple of groups with a small number of people that were doing sort of the day-to-day -day educating. Um, you know, fast forward to today, all of these large crypto companies are building out teams in Washington. These are policy professionals. These are government relations professionals. Uh, they're hiring outside lobbying firms. Now, granted, sometimes these people get hired and it takes them a while to figure out what the heck is going on in crypto because this is super complicated. But the point is there are a lot of people who wake up every morning who are paid to think about these issues. And, and Congress, I think, is feeling that, that presence. There's a couple other ways that it's happening. Um, one, or I guess the second way would be uh, political contributions. Then we can go into much more in, in depth on this, but whether it be on the super PAC side or sort of the hard dollar PAC side, these are sort of direct contributions to campaigns that, that are capped at certain limits. You know, there's a lot of activity going on in the political giving space. And I think this has been really positive for the crypto industry. And if you're a member of Congress who is, you know, 
has no choice but to raise a bunch of money to run for re-election, you're trying to figure out where is the money coming from, and, and crypto is a place where money is coming from. The third, which I think is really the most important thing, is that there are individuals in every single district or state um, around the country that are you know, working in, building on, participating in the crypto ecosystem. And that is a very vocal community that is willing to pick up the phone and call their member of Congress in a time of crisis um, or to, to be there to help educate. So, you know, between the professionals on the ground, the political giving and just the people back at home that care about this space, the crypto industry is in a much, much better position than we, we've ever been to date. And I think that as more and more sort of use cases come online and the, as the industry grows and the ecosystem grows, you know, we're going to be in a place where we'll have this golden moment as an industry where we're going to be able to get good policy enacted into law because the political climate is going to be such that we'll be able to get that done. You really laid a great foundation of what the landscape looks like. I want to zero in on the second aspect of what you talked about, which is the amount of money that's going in from, you know, whether it's PACs or super PACs. How much has it increased like year over year? And what portion of the pie, if you were to guesstimate, is it of the total amount of money which is obviously you know that's interesting I, I actually don't have great numbers on that other than a year ago it was close to zero got it and today it's you know tens of millions of dollars right and where does that move the needle yes it does move the needle um it's it's funny it's it's um you know if, if you look in maybe sort of like the venture world or um you know sort of anything in the business world the amount of money it takes to influence Washington is laughably small. That's such, it, it's, such, it's such a funny point because I, I won't name the CEO, but I, w I met with a very prominent executive. And he said to me basically exactly what you said. He had a staffer come up to him of a, of a congressperson to talk about a, a contribution. And he described the staffer as like insanely nervous to ask for an amount of money, which would just be nothing to him. And it sort of painted a picture of exactly what you're talking about, which is there's a disconnect between maybe how much money there is in crypto and maybe how much money people on the Hill think is in crypto. Yeah, yeah. So th if you think about it this way, so th there's really two types of political giving, which then are sort of categorized into subtypes, right? But there's really sort of two types. It's There's super PACs. This is where you can have individuals, corporations, giving unlimited amounts of money into a vehicle that then can go and do independent expenditures in various campaigns around the country. And the independence is sort of a key distinction from the other type of political, political giving, which are hard dollars that are given directly to campaigns, but are typically the source of those are only individuals um, or they're individuals giving to PACs that then give to campaigns, these political action committees. Uh, but there's limits to how much money you can give there. So on the super PAC side, um, I think the most prominent one out there is GMI PAC. I think mm -hmm. they've done a phenomenal job working with both House races, Senate races, Republicans, Democrats. And if you're at a company and you like what they're doing, you can give corporate dollars. Or if you're a wealthy individual, you can give money to that. And what they'll do is they'll decide, hey, we think there's a certain set of messaging that might work for a certain congressman or senator. We're going to go and do an ad buy and buy up TV time or do a mailer and, and send that. Now, the restrictions are they cannot coordinate directly with the campaign. Um, that, that's sort of one type of political giving. And I think the crypto industry is, is starting to engage on that level in, in a pretty sophisticated way and have really good professionals behind it. The other kind of political giving, are, as I mentioned, are these sort of direct hard dollar contributions. And those come in, in, in many forms. And if you're an individual that wants to donate to a political campaign, 
there is a maximum of $5,800 mm-hmm. that you can give. So any sort of CEO or executive or individual in the crypto space, if they want to give to Congressman X or Congresswoman Y or Senator Z, it's it's $5,800 per every two-year cycle. And so, like, at the, in the end of the day, like, if, if you're a max out donor to a congressperson, like that's that's valuable. Um, you know, you, you're not going to be ignored. Your phone calls aren't going to be denied. And so, you know, obviously there's 535 members of the the House and Senate combined. Then, and, and so you can't necessarily get to all of those. But but a $5,800 check goes a long way. And when the crypto industry comes together, and you get 10 people or 20 people that'll write $5,800 checks. All of a sudden, you're doing a hundred thousand, maybe close to two hundred thousand dollar fundraiser for a member of Congress, and that's money that they get to decide how to use, as opposed to a super PAC where the super PAC independently is deciding how to use it. Like that's that's actually like incredibly powerful. Um, I do think there's some other really great sort of hard dollar political giving efforts. I mean, I can say at the Blockchain Association, we're in the process of forming our own political action committee where individuals who work for member companies of the trade association can donate to the PAC. And then we will, you know, help decide how to use those dollars. And, and, you know, that that's a common tool that many companies and trade associations use in Washington. And then I'm also involved, as you well know, with, with HODL PAC, which Mm -hmm. um, is, is designed to give, you know, sort of individuals around the country who might want to do smaller dollar donations, an opportunity to evaluate candidates, choose who they can donate to, and do it in a way where there is matching funds available. And, you know, that's a really great option as well. So so we're starting to see the infrastructure being put in place. I wouldn't say it's a fully mature political operation, but it's certainly uh, reaching maturity very quickly. And I think it's one of the reasons why we're seeing more success. Because at the end of the day, it's, you know, we need to get people elected to Congress that are excited and passionate about this space. And, you know, supporting candidates who support this space is one way to do that. Um, For those who are already in Congress, it's just a really great way to build relationships. And at the end of the day, that that's a really big piece of piece of influence. And, And so, you know, you want to make sure you you know the folks that you're you're going to ask favors of, and, and political giving is a great way to do that. So, where does the Blockchain Association find itself in this new, fast changing environment? Is I imagine the 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 main function has changed from four years ago. Yeah. Well. So you know, at the end of the day, we're a, a public policy developing and advocacy organization. And we have uh, now 91 member companies that contribute via dues to the association. And our primary functions are working with our members to figure out what the policy positions on any given issues might be, whether it be securities laws or tax policy or stablecoin or illicit finance or climate. You know, there's all these issues out there that we need to have informed opinions on and and develop solutions to, right? And and that's a work in progress. Like we don't have the, hey, here's the 200 page legislation we'd like to see introduced. Like that is a work in progress. It takes a long time to coalesce the industry around a single uniform position. And that that's a work in progress. So we're continuing to do that work. But unlike three and a half years ago when we launched, I mean, it was just, hey, we care about securities laws issues. Those issues have multiplied. Yeah. So what are the what are the issues today? Yeah. Well, so listen, securities laws issues are still a big issue. Right. And figuring out when tokens are security or not are important. One of the reasons it's important is because securities markets are regulated, whereas commodity spot spot markets are unregulated. And I think if we actually find a good way to have a federal regulator for commodity spot markets, that will actually be less of an issue um, than it is today. But that that continues to be ongoing. There's a tremendous amount of interest between both the Treasury Department and members of Congress in finding out a way to regulate dollar-backed stable coins and having some parameters around disclosures around the reserves, um, redemption policies, things like that. There's a lot of great proposals from Senator Pat Toomey, from Josh Gottheimer from New Jersey, other members of Congress that are thinking about this space. 
you know, illicit finance policy is actually, I think, in a pretty good spot. Um, the Department of Treasury and the Financial Crimes Enforcement Network were some of the earliest regulators mm. to opine on this issue back in like 2013, 2014. And so that policy is actually in a pretty good spot. I think that may change as as DeFi gains momentum, but but right now it's it's really just doing a lot of education around that space. And then our, our biggest battle right now is is oddly, uh, maybe not oddly, um, at the New York State level where they're trying to do a, a, a moratorium on Bitcoin mining. So, but all of this is to say we have we have a great policy team led by uh, Jake Travinsky that mm -hmm. works on these issues. We also have a government relations team that goes and does the day-to-day -day educating, lobbying, engaging with, with policymakers on these issues. We have a communications team that helps with the messaging and, and getting, you know, the right information out there about these issues. And then, you know, we do things for our members that are a member services team. Mm -hmm. But as this relates to political giving, going back to your original question, you know, we as an association, we don't participate in the super PAC side, right? Like those are individuals in the industry that are working on that. We're certainly happy to see them there and we're, we're standing on the sidelines cheering them along, but that's, that's not our, our core function as a trade association. You know, I, in my personal capacity, write a lot of checks to people. So, hey, if I can do it, and then other people who've made a lot more money than I can can probably do it. Um, you know, and, It's just like one ETH or um, two ETH. Just, just some ETH. Not that bad. Yeah, just some ETH. But no, I'm, I'm you know, happy to do that because I think it's really important that, that we do that as an ecosystem. And, and I want to, you know, you know, if I'm asking people to donate, it's because I'm also donating myself. So if myself. I gave a congressman 56, I think was that? 5,800. 50, 5, they will really, they'll talk to me? It's, is it that easy? I mean, you could, they'll talk to you for less than that, but yeah. Um, really interesting. Um, but yeah, it's a, it's a, I mean, it's a, it's, it's a lot, right? Like if you're running for election, you need to raise millions of dollars and you have to do it in $5,800 increments or yeah, less. So you, right? yeah. So anytime you can bite off that big chunk, but no, but, but going back to the association, our, our most our role is going to be when we get our political action committee launched, you know, that's going to be a pot of money that we use to, you know, develop relationships that are important for the association. So a lot of the activity today is not is happening outside of the formal realm of the blockchain association, but it's happening, you know, through these other organizations that are popping up and, you know, because I am super passionate about this space and I'm, I'm super convinced that engaging on a political level is, is key to our success that, that I, you know, try to stay informed on all of those efforts and, and direct those in the ecosystem that are interested in this space to, to the ones that I think are, are worthy of investing in and, and participating in and donating to. Having trouble keeping pace with the crypto boom? When your business is scaling up and your portfolio is growing, you don't want to waste precious time on manual treasury management or settling in rebalancing. Fireblocks can handle that for you with smart, scalable solutions for your crypto business, along with industry-leading security and expertise. They'll take care of the back end so you can focus on the big picture. Visit fireblocks.com to learn more. This episode is brought to you by Coinbase Prime, an integrated solution that provides institutional investors with an advanced trading platform, secure custody, and prime services to manage all their crypto assets in one place. Coinbase Prime fully integrates crypto trading and custody on a single platform and gives clients the best all-in pricing in their network using their proprietary smart order router and algorithmic execution. Futuristic companies like Tesla and MicroStrategy have already used Coinbase's comprehensive investing platform to execute some of the largest trades in the industry. Build a unified investment portfolio with one of the most trusted names in crypto. Learn more by visiting coinbase.com prime to get started today. 
This episode is brought to you by Cross River. Building the next big thing in crypto? Then it's time to get your fiat on and off ramp solution from Cross River. Whether you're a crypto exchange, NFT marketplace, or wallet, Cross River's integrated API based platform provides the payment solutions you need to grow. Cross River is powering the future of financial services. A crypto fin industry award winner and an early partner for companies like Coinbase, Cross River's tech stack supports crypto partners and enables real-time money movement for consumers. Welcome to a new world of crypto-friendly banking. Request your fiat on and off ramp solution now at crossriver.com slash crypto. One thing that I find really interesting is the question of whether crypto is bipartisan. I don't know if we've talked about it on other shows, but a lot of people not even from the policy side, like, you know, the trading side or the tech side. It's a question people ask me as if I, if I know anything, you know, but the sense I think people have is that it's getting, here's the issue. Like you have people who I think are concerned that crypto might be partisan or leans a certain way, right? When you have, um, some of the loudest voices, right, are maybe a Lummis or a Ted Cruz. And that concerns some people because they don't want crypto to be totally viewed as being on the right. Then you also have SBF, right, who obviously made major contributions to the Biden campaign. So I'll put it very simply. You know, if someone were to ask you, is crypto bipartisan, what would you say? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think... You know, I think if you look back through sort of the history of policymaker involvement in crypto, you know, you have kind of a mixed history. A, a, a lot of the early champions were folks, Republicans specifically in the House, that were interested in this. And I think a lot of that is due to sort of the libertarian, you know, foundation uh, and connection to, to Bitcoin. But as we've moved forward through time, we've seen what was once sort of a maybe arguably Republican issue become mm-hmm. incredibly bipartisan. Now, that's not to say that we don't have enemies on the Democratic side of the aisle. I mean, I would say that Elizabeth Warren is not, you know, not a fan of this, right? Yeah. <laughs> I would say that Brad Sherman on the House from California is not a fan of this. Um, I would argue Gary Gensler has significant concerns about this space. I think that's that's pretty clear. But what we have today that we didn't have a year ago is we have Ron Wyden, Democrat from Oregon, standing up on the Senate floor defending crypto during the infrastructure debate. We have Kirsten Gillibrand, Senator from New York, you know, standing up with Cynthia Lummis, who otherwise is kind of considered to be you know, fairly, fairly conservative saying, I want to work with my friend Cynthia to figure out a way to do this. We've got Joe Biden, the de facto head of the Democratic Party, putting out an executive order saying, hey, it's important for the U.S. to be the leader in digital asset innovation, and we want to find a way to have responsible innovation. Like, that's a completely awesome and amazing position and way better, by the way, than when Trump tweeted that he like thought Bitcoin was a scam, right? Yeah. So, so that's progress. We've got the Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen giving a whole speech that was basically saying like we've got to we've got to figure this out, but we don't want to, you know, we want to make sure innovation. I still feel important. like she's kind of in the you know blockchain, not crypto camp. I think a cynic might ask you, okay, that's you know all all good, but to an extent, and maybe I'm wrong, the most vocal critics are all democratic there's not really a vocal critic that's a republican well you could argue that secretary mnuchin was a pretty or or donald trump were, were republicans that you know, might not be in the spotlight today, but they were pretty negative on this space um but yeah if you look out today tbt to the treasury drop yes the uh that was scary (laughs) Yeah, that ruined my Christmas. That probably did ruin your Christmas. I know. If we, we need, rewind, we need to the like clock. start thinking about my holidays and not the public policy of the United States. But um, no, I think today Republicans, for the most part, are either crypto champions or crypto curious. Democrats are partially crypto champions. A very large swath are crypto curious. 
and a small portion are, you know, crypto skeptics. But I think that as time goes on, as for all the reasons we discussed earlier, the political power of the crypto industry rises. But most importantly, like the we realize the promise of decentralized networks. When when we return power to the hands of individuals, when we disrupt the banking system, when we disrupt large internet platforms, when we see that crypto is actually the solution to all of the problems that we have with large intermediated institutions, then we're going to get those crypto skeptics on our side. And and time is on our side, right? Mm. Like what, what we don't want are super rushed policies that aren't well thought out being jammed through without full comment and debate. Where we win is when we have time, when we can get into the weeds, when we have the opportunity to d- develop solutions and we can have an informed, thoughtful discussion and debate. Like that that's how we get good policy. And so so the longer the longer we can have that discussion and debate, the more powerful we're going to be politically and just the better off ultimately the policies are are going to be. So, you know, it's going to be rocky for the next 6, 12, 18, 24 months, right? As mm-hmm. some of these policies are put forth and we have to go back and explain things and examine unintended consequences. But, you know, looking a couple years out, like I think I think we're going to strike a really good balance here in the US because people are invested in this, they like it, they're participating in it and they want it and and you know, policymakers aren't going to ignore that. They they won't be able to ignore that. Do you focus at all on like local state policy or, or not so much? Yeah. So we, um, we traditionally had not, we'd been very focused on federal cause we felt like there were a lot of issues there. And it, as you and I have discussed, we were heavily under-resourced for a long time. Yeah. I would start, I would argue still under-resourced, but way better resourced than we used to be. Um, you, you used to complain all the time. Well, it's like, it's like, everyone's like, why can't you do this? Cause there's no money. (laughs) Like there's no money. You got to hire people to do these things. I need money. Um, anyway, I've, I've since convinced people to give me money. So that was good. But, uh, something specific, like I'm thinking of the New York state, Yes. like recently to ban mining. Yes. So about two months ago, we hired a great guy named John Olson, who is on the ground in Albany, formerly worked for the internet association, Uh, We brought him on board um, specifically to help us with New York. So this is the first time where we've had a dedicated uh, sort of state effort. And, you know, the reasons are are several fold. Most most sort of acutely uh, is this uh, legislation that's working its way through the New York legislature that would put a two-year moratorium on uh, sort of new Bitcoin mining in the state. And if you think about it, you know, there's a lot of mining operations that would not be affected. Some that are would be affected because they don't have their permits renewed. But the bigger problem is it sends a really, really bad signal to anyone who's thinking about maybe putting investment in New York if the state legislature is, you know, preventing you from doing Bitcoin mining, which, by the way, is largely done by like hydropower and is is like creating a lot of jobs in communities that are very eager to have well-paid high, high tech jobs. Right. So, um, so, so the, it's, it's stupid and it also will just like pop up across the border or in Texas or someplace else. So overall it doesn't actually like change anything. It just takes the jobs out of New York, but there's, you know, there's other issues in New York, right? Like New York's the finance capital of the world. I mean, there's a really cool office at the block there. At least there once was, that's important that we keep that in New York, but uh, the the bit license and, and credit to Adrian Harris, the, the current superintendent of DFS, like she's working to speed up getting those applications processed. But you know, it's a cumbersome process. If you combine the bit license with the Bitcoin mining moratorium, why the heck would you start a crypto business in New York, right? Like yeah. it's just it's just doesn't make sense. And so, you know, we we're, we want to get that that stopped. We have a pretty good effort going on. Um, if you're in New York, I highly encourage you to call your senator or congressman. 
You can go to our website at theblockchainassociation.org for information on how to do that. But yeah, you can pick up the phone and you can call them, you can email them, you can tweet at them, um, you can make political donations, you know, mm. you can do do all of these things. But, you know, I'm I'm hopeful that we're able to stop this, but it's one of those things that we only started engaging on about two months ago because it really just got to sort of a crisis point. That's pretty interesting. We'll have to get him on the show to talk like specifically, you know, that'd be a really good show for Ashlyn who does the yeah. policy scoop to just do like something on, on New York. Yeah, um, no, he'd be great. He could give you all the ins and outs. It's a different, Albany is a different beast, right? Yeah, yeah. I bet it is. Um, just looking at the script. I, l- I love that you just like have a whole script. I you, do. You have well, your they, people are, are doing this. They make me, they do a good job. And honestly, this one's really good. Sometimes they, they dig into stuff and they figure out really cool things to ask. So you guys are getting a bit of behind the scenes of of the show here on this on this lot. Well, it's not live, but we're not cutting that out. Boots on the ground. <laughs> no, I don't think so. I, I mean, right. I'm in the podcast. Yeah, <laughs> you're, uh, well, he hopes he may. Yeah, we definitely got to keep Jeff, <laughs> Jeff in. Um, and, and the laughter. I I killed a bee on one of the other shows, and I'm glad there's no bees here. Dean loves to deliberate on things, and so we had like a whole meeting on whether to keep the the. The bee. the bee in, um, <laughs> and we kept the bee in. I, it was, my mother was really annoyed because um, I said I said the Lord's name in vain a couple times. Oh dear! So she was she right. was not pleased. Um, <laughs> so went to confession and and cleared that up. Um, in any case, okay. So let's think about let's think about a way to close the show. Okay. Um, honestly, that was a that could be a good close, but. Oh, here's a good question. What do people in DC think about NFTs? Oh my God, they love them. Yeah, because it's like a new, it's kind of, NFTs and DAOs are kind of a new way to almost like do what a, a pact is to an extent. Yeah. You're building no, a community and getting yeah, money. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's interesting. So I think if you talk to people in the crypto world, they're like, hmm, is this like sort of NFT thing a bubble or what are the other uses of NFTs or, you know, they'll, they'll tend to be a little bit more maybe critical or, or maybe maybe just analytical of, of what's going on in the space. I think for policymakers, it's, they're super interested in it. And I think one of the reasons it's been such an effective educational tool is that you can literally see an NFT. Like if we're talking about you know, digital collectibles or art or things like that. Right. And it's, you know, it's one thing to go in and try to describe Bitcoin and, you know, you can like see the wheels turning and like a policymaker's head as they're trying to like figure out how that might work, but you can actually show them an NFT and you can sort of show them how it's recorded on the blockchain and, it, I think it's just been a really good way to talk about what digital scarcity is. And it's, yeah, we get more, I would say it's probably our number one most requested meeting or briefing topic. Really? To learn about this space. Because they're excited about it. It's almost They're excited story. about it. They they want to get, and, it's, and again, I think it's literally because they can visualize it. But what about the ESG concern? Well, I mean, there, that hasn't translated so much to NFTs. We hear it a lot for Bitcoin. But the NFTs are, I mean, unless they're on. Don't tell that to anyone, (laughs) Frank. No, right now it's in just a very much sort of learning phase. I mean, I think as we move forward, there's going to be a bunch of questions, right? There will be ESG questions. There will be intellectual property questions. You know, there's going to be securities laws questions. There's going to be AML KYC questions. I mean, I think there's a lot of different policy issues on that space. But but right now, it's it's a really great opportunity to engage with policymakers. It's a really good tangible example that they're they're able to sort of wrap their heads around that that's a lot easier to explain than some of the other, you know, sort of crypto asset applications that we yeah, have out there. Yeah, because you can see it. And like some, yeah, of the arts, see it. some of the art's good. People like art. Yeah. Kristen Smith of the Blockchain Association. Thanks for carving out the time. My pleasure. This has um, been the highlight of my day here in the Bahamas. Honestly, this was a lot of fun. This yeah. was this was a good one. Next and time it's we'll nice do it at the doing pool. it in person. It is fun. We'll be back, and I'm you know. I know gonna... we we originally did this like in your office in 
in uh, well, you, NYU. You were at like that little loft you, space. You, you guys were back had. when we had the. We were, oh, in the we work. work. Yeah, yeah. I came like That's down in the financial district. Really early. That was like we didn't even. Yeah, have... I remember Graham on my team was like, "You got to talk to these guys. They're doing this thing called like the block. You got to go talk to them." And I'm like, "Huh?" And I like found my way there. And yeah, I forgot about that. That was that was, and that was the first time we had ever was old ever school. spoke to each other. So you must have been yeah. That must have been like the fifth. That must have been episode. 2019 or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, you were brand new. <laughs> <laughs> uh, where can listeners learn more about what you're doing uh definitely please check out our website the blockchain association.org or you can follow us on twitter at blockchain assn uh, you can follow me at km smith dc or really if you want to know what's going on please follow jake trevinsky yeah. at j c h e r v i n s k y uh he is uh, always has amazing analysis and wisdom of what's going on in this space. Yeah. And um, he's got such I've, good... I've followed him before you follow me. Yeah. I mean, he's got a really big following. Yeah. Um, well, thank you. All right. Thanks, All right. The Scoop will be back for you again with another great guest. Have an awesome day, everyone. Looking for more great insights from The Block? Check out The Block Research, the premier platform for research content on crypto markets and the digital asset industry. The Block Research membership includes cutting edge reports, webinars, company maps, and more available via our dedicated research portal. Visit theblockresearch.com to find out how to join today or contact a member of our sales team at sales at theblockcrypto.com and let them know that Frank sent you.